Hello and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. Tropical Storm Elsa makes landfall in Florida. Hurricane and tropical storm warnings in effect for a long stretch of coastline. How is it affecting search efforts at the condo collapse? DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas meets with the president of Guatemala to discuss immigration. This as residents of Texas describe escalating tensions with increasingly aggressive illegal immigrants on their property. The Pentagon defending its decision to vacate and turn over an airbase to Afghan security forces. That's while the Taliban attacks a capital city in a province in northwestern Afghanistan. A leaked internal document in Thailand fuels skepticism against the Chinese-made Sinovac vaccine. It called for a booster shot of an mRNA vaccine for medical staff in the country, but one comment in the report said the move would erode public confidence in the doses. And the president of Haiti shot dead in his home overnight, his wife suffering injuries, the interim prime minister calling it an inhumane and barbaric act. (music) Tropical storm Elsa makes landfall on Florida's northern Gulf Coast. The National Hurricane Center says it's forecast to move across the southeastern United States through Thursday. Entity's Jessica Beatty reports. Elsa weakened to a tropical storm as of early Wednesday. The National Hurricane Center expects heavy rainfall, high winds, and a storm surge to continue across parts of Florida. It's also issued a storm watch for parts of the mid-Atlantic coast. Last week, Elsa briefly strengthened into the first hurricane of the season. And battling Elsa's outer bands, rescuers in Surfside, Florida, recovered more bodies from the site of the Champlain Towers condo collapse. I ask all of all of you around the world who are continuing to follow this story to please keep these victims and these families in your hearts and prayers. Some family members think they're out of time. I had hope for the first week, maybe, but after the the first week, uh, I lost that hope. Officials still not conceding. We're in a uh, search and rescue mode. It's an active investigation and that's and we're focused right now. Our primary goal right now is to bring closure to the families. Five million pounds of debris have already been removed from the site. The already challenging work made more complex as Elsa moved closer to South Florida. We have a meteorologist embedded in the team right with them on the mound to provide any weather updates to make sure that they are safe. The storm's greatest impact is expected on the other side of the state along Florida's North Gulf Coast. And mourners in Miami Beach remembered the lives of two children and their parents Tuesday. It's the first funeral for victims of the condo collapse. Hearses carried the bodies of Marcus Guara, his wife Anna Guara, and their daughters Lucia 10 and Emma 4. The two children were placed together in a white casket at the family's request. Experts warn it's unlikely any survivors will be found now after so much time has passed. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas praised Guatemala's efforts to provide safe and orderly pathways of immigration to the U.S. after a meeting with Guatemala's president. This as the crisis at the southern U.S. border reaches a boiling point with some South Texas residents. NTD's Colin Fredrickson has the story. U.S. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas met with Guatemalan President Alejandro Giamate Tuesday to discuss immigration. Mayorkas praised Giamate for cooperating with the U.S. and Mexico on immigration. The president, the minister, the government of Guatemala is doing um, tremendous work in addressing uh, the challenge of irregular migration in partnership with us. He says the two countries are working together to help people migrate more safely. We are also, uh, importantly, together uh, building safe, legal, and orderly pathways for people to migrate uh, north. Mayorkas' trip to Guatemala follows a visit there by U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris. The Biden administration says they plan to deal with the illegal immigration crisis by fixing the root causes of the problem. In Texas, residents tell the Epoch Times that tensions are rising with increasingly aggressive immigrants. Some residents say they're too scared to leave their homes. Others report tense armed standoffs with immigrants who demand rides or damage their property. Rancher John Sewell describes driving illegal immigrants off his property with dogs and a gun. 
He tells the Epoch Times, In 25 years, I've never personally carried a gun. In the last five months, I carry one every single day. That ought to tell you all you need to know. Allison Anderson says she's alarmed at the increase in the number of sex offenders coming across the border. Agents in her sector report a 1,400% increase in arrests of illegal aliens with sex-related criminal convictions this fiscal year. Anderson has three daughters under six. She says she had to drive groups of men off her property with a firearm on multiple occasions while her husband was at work. She says she's always on guard. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. The Pentagon is defending its move to exit the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. Stepping up to the plate is an Afghan resistance leader who says they're ready to stand up to the Taliban. This while insurgents attack the capital of a northwestern province in the country. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby on Tuesday said there was coordination with Afghan leaders about the turnover of Bagram Air Base. He said he can't speak to the information passing through the Afghan chain of command, but the move was communicated beforehand. But I can tell you that Afghan leaders, civilian and military, were appropriately coordinated with and briefed about the turnover of Bagram uh, Air Base. Uh, and, and in fact, some of that briefing can, um, included a, a walkthrough uh, of facilities on the base with senior Afghan leaders. The U.S. had occupied the base for nearly 20 years, and on Monday, U.S. troops vacated the base in the middle of the night. They shut off electricity and, according to Afghan military officials, did not notify the base's new Afghan commander. Looters ransacked the base's barracks before the Afghan army could arrive. Kirby said the U.S. couldn't disclose the exact hour they would depart for security reasons. Resistance leader Ahmad Massoud is stepping up in an effort to prevent a Taliban takeover. They're going to fight for the rights of the uh, women, and they're going to fight for many other values that we cherished and we loved and we achieved in the past two, three decades. This while Taliban insurgents attacked the capital of Afghanistan's northwestern Badghis province, according to officials. The governor said the Taliban was attacking them from three directions and Afghan security forces were fighting them back. Hamid Karzai, the former president of Afghanistan, weighs in. The West must explain to us the presence of Daesh in Afghanistan. It emerged during the U.S. presence in Afghanistan in the name of fight against extremism and terrorism. So they have failed. Daesh is another word for ISIS. Negotiations between the Taliban and Afghan government in Qatar haven't made much progress in recent months, but the two have been holding meetings in recent days. The U.S. banned air travel to Belarus Tuesday. This follows the arrest of an opposition journalist who's a prominent critic of Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. Entity's Don Ma has the story. The Department of Transportation issued an order Tuesday blocking air carriers from selling tickets to Belarus. The move is in response to the arrest of Raman Patasevich, a 26-year-old activist, journalist, and prominent critic of Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. On May 23rd, flight controllers in Belarus forced a plane carrying Protasevich to land as it crossed the country's airspace. They claimed there was a bomb on the plane and sent a fighter jet to escort the plane to land. Authorities then arrested Protasevich and his girlfriend. An international outcry erupted over the incident. The US, European Union, UK and Canada all imposed sanctions on Belarus. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki called on Lukashenko to allow an investigation of the incident and released all political prisoners. Lukashenko has a communist background from his days in the Soviet Union. He's ruled Belarus with an iron grip and communist policies for decades. Mass protests erupt in Belarus last year following a landslide election victory for Lukashenko. Many people say that election was rigged. Don Ma, NTD News. The White House says it will act if Russia does not deal with the ransomware hackers who broke into systems at software company Kaseya. The hack is attributed to hacker group R Evil. If the Russian government cannot or will not take action against criminal actors residing in Russia, we will take action uh, or reserve the right uh, to take action uh, on our own. The intelligence community has not yet attributed the attack. Uh, the cybersecurity community agrees that our evil uh, operates out of Russia with affiliates around the world. Hundreds of Kaseya's corporate clients have been affected by the attack. A Kremlin spokesman said there were what he called certain contracts, contacts between Moscow and Washington on the subject of cybercrime and accusations that Russia-linked crime groups were sometimes involved. 
President Biden plans to meet with leaders from the State Department, Justice Department, and Homeland Security to discuss strategies to counter ransomware attacks. The White House continues to urge companies hit by cyber attacks to not pay the ransom. Haitian President Jovenel Moise was shot dead by unidentified attackers in his private residence overnight. Interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph calling it an inhumane and barbaric act. A president killed overnight at his home. The interim Haitian Prime Minister Claude Joseph announcing the news Wednesday that President Jovenel Moise had been shot dead, calling the killing an inhumane and barbaric act. He said Moise was shot by unidentified attackers. He added that Moise's wife was injured and was receiving medical care. The attack comes amid a rising wave of politically linked violence in the impoverished Caribbean nation. With Haiti politically divided and facing a growing humanitarian crisis and shortages of food, there are fears of widespread disorder. Gunshots could be heard throughout Port-au-Prince. The capital had been suffering an increase in violence as gangs battle one another and police for control of the streets. It's been over six months since the tragic events unfolded at the nation's capital. More than 500 people have been arrested for having some connection to the capital breach, and more than a dozen have pleaded guilty. And others arrested who did not plead guilty have spent months in jail, reportedly under harsh conditions. Lawyers of the defendants now calling their treatment unconstitutional. NTD's Melina Weiskup brings us the details from Washington, D.C. Right here at this city jail in Washington, D.C., around 50 people are still being detained for allegedly taking part in the chaos at the Capitol on January 6th. That's six months ago, and these people are still awaiting their day in court. But time stretches longer for those who are subject to solitary confinement. Some are reportedly being held in solitary confinement for up to 23 hours a day. Again, these are people who have not been convicted yet. Uh, Jake right now is um, there. They have an area in the uh, prison that's called the hole and he is down in the hole uh, with another uh, individual, Dominic. While others reportedly denied medical treatment. One is named Christopher Worrell. He has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, that has been getting worse while he is in pretrial detention. He has not been permitted to uh, see his oncologist. Uh, he has not been permitted to receive the uh, medications and cancer treatment that his oncologist uh, has prescribed. The lawyers and others now pushing back against what they're saying is inhumane treatment. And some unlikely allies have also spoken up. Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren called solitary confinement a form of punishment that is cruel and psychologically damaging and noted that these are people who are not yet convicted. And Senator Dick Durbin told Politico there has to be clear justification for that. Ned Lang's son is charged with a number of counts, including civil disorder, resisting or assaulting officers with a weapon, disruptive conduct, and an act of physical violence in a restricted building or grounds. Lang says if his son is guilty, he should pay the price. But he begs the question, why was there not equal treatment for others who were on the opposite side of the political spectrum? But the bottom line is, is that what's happening out in other parts of the country by other folks who are on the other side of the political spectrum doing the same things or walking away having all their charges dropped. That's not okay. That's not what America is about. That's not what our Bill of Rights are, are, are about. Some GOP lawmakers are also questioning this double standard. Senator Ted Cruz and four others sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland noting that during the 2020 summer riots, one officer was killed and hundreds of other officers were injured. Cruz asked the attorney general, were those protesters involved with the summer riots also tracked and arrested the same way the January 6th protesters were? How many of the summer protesters engaged in violence were held in solitary confinement, like those involved in the January 6th protest and who are still in this D.C. jail? Now, we have contacted the jail here to hear their response to these allegations. They haven't gotten back to us just yet. The Department of Justice is also not responding to requests for comments on this issue. We'll release more updates as more information becomes available. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And just one person has been sentenced for the breach. 49-year-old Anna Morgan Lloyd was put on probation last month. And just then, former President Trump announced plans to sue Twitter, Facebook, and Google. The firm suspended his social media accounts six months ago over his comments following the January 6th Capitol incident. 
Trump and his team explain the lawsuits seek to protect the First Amendment right to free speech. They argued that his rights were denied when, he, when the three big tech companies banned him. The suits will be filed in a U.S. district court in South Florida. The Alaska judge to order social media companies to immediately stop the alleged shadow banning, censoring, blacklisting, and canceling of people who express political viewpoints outside the mainstream. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, Google CEO and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey were named in the lawsuits, plus the companies themselves. Google, Facebook, and Twitter didn't immediately respond to requests for comment. Trump called the legal action just the beginning. And in other news, a judge sentences a 14-year-old girl to the maximum allowable penalty over a fatal carjacking. The girl pled guilty to killing Uber Eats driver Mohamed Anwar while trying to forcefully take his car with another teenage girl. The incident gained national notoriety when a witness caught it on video and posted it to social media. Prosecutors say the girl showed no remorse after the incident. The judge sentenced her to remain in juvenile detention until she turns 21. It's the maximum allowable penalty under Washington, D.C. law for a person her age. The identities of the two teenagers haven't been released. A GoFundMe page for Anwar says he was a beloved husband, a father, and grandfather, and he'll be missed dearly. The page has raised over $1 million in donations. China's COVID-19 vaccine has made its way around the world to developing countries. Made by biotech company Sinovac, multiple cases of surgical infections are now raising doubts about its effectiveness. This week, a leaked government memo in Thailand has stirred up concern among its citizens. Here are the details. A leaked memo from Thailand's Ministry of Health is raising public concern about the Chinese-made Sinovac vaccine. The document called for a booster shot of the mRNA vaccine for medical personnel in Thailand. But it included an objection from an unnamed official, saying that would amount to it admitting that Sinovac is ineffective. The Thai health minister confirmed the memo as authentic, adding that the comment is only an opinion. This doesn't mean the views would turn into action. There are many procedures after that. The hashtag Give Pfizer to Medical Personnel started trending on Thai Twitter after the leaked document was published by local media. Bangkok residents responded soon after. Is it dangerous to us? I was concerned about that too. That's why I don't want to get vaccinated. There's no guarantee. Anyone would be scared because this has to do with life or death. The chairman of Thailand's Thanburi Healthcare Group pointed out that five hospital staff members got reinfected with the CCP virus after receiving the Sinovac vaccine. This means the vaccine Sinovac can't protect people from the virus and the symptoms will be severe, compared to those who got the AstraZeneca vaccine, which barely has resulted in anyone being admitted to the hospital. Thailand has already acquired 20 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for future use. 1.5 million doses donated by the United States will arrive this month. Just ahead, Eric Adams is declared the winner of the Democratic primary for New York City mayor. He beat his closest rival by just over one percentage point. Several individuals are arraigned in court in connection with an armed standoff that began Saturday morning in Massachusetts, but refused to cooperate with the proceedings. All that and more here on NTD News. Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams has won the Democratic primary for mayor of New York City. He is a former police captain and would be the city's second black mayor if elected. Adams triumphed over a large field in New York's first major race to use ranked choice voting. He solidified his lead over New York City mayoral candidates Maya Wiley and Catherine Garcia after the New York City Board of Elections released additional results Tuesday evening. The last tally shows Adams leading former city sanitation commissioner Garcia by over 8,000 votes or a little more than one percentage point. 60-year-old Adams opposes the defund the police movement. He now faces Republican contender Curtis Sliwa, but Adams is considered the front runner due to New York City's abundance of Democratic voters. All kinds of essential workers will be honored at today's parade in the Big Apple. One of those groups is especially powerful. And today's Arian Pastar brings us more. 
When you hear the term essential workers, you probably think about people working at the hospital, at the pharmacy, or maybe at your local supermarket. But have you ever noticed that during this entire pandemic, while most of us were sitting at home, your water kept running, your lights were on, and your TV was working? Well, here in New York, it was the workers at Con Edison who kept the power running. We were here every day. We didn't get laid off. According to one of the workers, the mental pressure was the hardest part. Going in and if I'm reading the meter and then now all of a sudden the person is coughing, I'm worrying, is it flu or is it COVID? One thing all of the workers agreed on is that their job was already dangerous before the pandemic. Sometimes they have to restore the power at accidents or fire sites or even worse. For example, the World Trade Center, right after that, the next day we were here working and we stay there for a good two to three weeks working restoring power so no matter what hits us no matter what happens in new york we will fix it one way or the other that's what we're here for he added that on another occasion he got hit by a car while doing reparations the impact sent him 70 feet up the road but the unusual time during the pandemic also had its positive sides now i was able to uh, you know, go to another field and learn forklift. Cert I got forklift certified, learn computer, which, you know, when you're in the field, you don't get those kind of options. Hiram needs his work truck to repair power lines. Such a big truck isn't exactly good for the usually congested Manhattan streets. It was uh, easier to drive, you know, faster to get to places uh, with no traffic, and, and it helped a lot. Although it seems like the pandemic is over, the workers here told us that they still feel the mental pressure of going out to work in the field every day. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. A group of people charged in Massachusetts refused to cooperate with the court during their arraignments Tuesday. They were arrested in connection with an armed standoff along a highway in the state last weekend. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Quinn Cumberland of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, was the first to appear. He told the judge he was a foreign national who can't face criminal charges. He also said he didn't want a defense attorney. The judge eventually held him without bail pending a hearing, scheduled for Friday. Another defendant, Robert Rodriguez from the Bronx, asked that a fellow defendant serve as his attorney. A third defendant refused to identify himself to authorities and told the judge he was a free Moor. The defendants say they're members of a group called Rise of the Moors. Several of their supporters were also in court. They face several charges, including unlawful possession of a firearm and ammunition, and the use of body armor in commission of a crime. State police say they recovered three AR-15 rifles, two pistols, a bolt-action rifle, a shotgun, and a short-barrel rifle. The standoff started early Saturday morning on Interstate 95 in Wakefield. A state trooper stopped to offer assistance to the vehicles he found on the side of the highway. The men were dressed in military fatigues and body armor and were armed with long guns and pistols. Police explained the group didn't have licenses to carry firearms in Massachusetts. They told police they were traveling from Rhode Island to Maine to conduct what they called training. Some of the defendants ran into the woods along the highway, leading to a standoff that lasted several hours. The Southern Poverty Law Center says the Moorish Sovereign Citizen Movement emerged in the 1990s. People in the movement believe individual citizens hold sovereignty over and are independent of the authority of federal and state governments. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Coming up, drought threatens Utah's Great Salt Lake, leaving only one remaining marina. Visitors and state park officials recount better days at the largest lake west of the Mississippi. And NASA teams up with universities to study the Mississippi River Delta. Researchers are using radar and a spectrometer to collect information on the waterway. Find out more in just a moment. I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled MyPillow. And to thank you for your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. For example, you get my six-piece towel sets, regular $109.99, now only $44.98. Or MyPillow dog beds for as low as $19.99 with your promo code. If your vehicle's manufacturer warranty is expired or is about to run out, you'll be on the hook for unexpected repairs. Breakdowns used to mean paying thousands out of pocket. Until now. 
Introducing Endurance Advantage, a vehicle protection plan with extensive breakdown coverage plus routine maintenance. As a mechanic, I see it all the time. A customer doesn't keep up with their regular maintenance and it leads to a breakdown or worse, disqualifies their warranty. No matter how many miles your car has, if it's under 20 years old, Endurance has you covered. That means insurance plus Endurance equals total protection. From oil and filter changes to brake pad and wiper blade replacements, Advantage provides maintenance coverage up to $3,500 per year. With Endurance Advantage, you'll never worry about paying for covered auto repairs or regular maintenance again. Call 800-574-6805 for a free quote. That's 800-574-6805. NASA is sending high-tech planes and boats out to Louisiana. It's part of a $15 million study of the Mississippi River Delta system there to help conserve the unique landforms. NASA scientists and a half a dozen universities from Boston to California are investigating river deltas, namely which parts of these dwindling areas can be shored up and which are past hope. Deltas appear when water deposits sediment at the river's mouth as it flows out into the ocean. Now, scientists aim to create computer models that can be used with satellite data to let countries around the world analyze these waters. NASA is studying the water flowing in and out of Louisiana's Atchafalaya and Terrebonne basins and the sediment carried by it. The agency wants to determine which plants can slow the flow, trap sediment, and pull carbon from the air. What does it take as far as sediment input and vegetation growth and, and the, the, the stage of the river flow and the interaction with the tides and, the, and coastal fronts and what are the impacts of hurricanes? All those are pieces of the puzzle to understand how deltas sustain themselves. Louisiana holds 40% of the nation's wetlands, but they're disappearing fast. About 2,000 square miles of the state has been lost since the 1930s. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, that's about 80% of the nation's wetland losses. And one of the toughest part about uh, working in a, in a delta is you can only touch one little piece of it at any one time and understand one little, one little piece of it at, at one time. Now we have the capability of working with NASA to understand the entire delta. NASA is using two kinds of radar and a spectrometer. These measure more colors than the human eye can distinguish. While airplanes have been collecting information like water level, slope, sediment, and the types of density of nearby plants. We can understand the growth, where the delta is growing, where it's not growing, why it's growing in certain locations and why it's not in others. You can't do that running around in a boat. Planes and boats went out in March and April to gather data, and they're set to do the same this fall for a second set of measurements. Two international satellites are scheduled for launch next year, each carrying one of the two kinds of radar used over Louisiana. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A number of San Francisco stores are suffering from increasing retail crime. Neiman Marcus is the latest target of organized retail theft. Here's NTD's Cynthia Sai with video footage from the incident. Cell phone video footage shared on Twitter shows 10 people running out of the store carrying handbags. The thieves are then seen entering getaway cars, waiting for them outside the store. Additional photos of the aftermath show smashed display cases, broken glass, and empty shelves. In response to a request for a comment on this issue, the Neiman Marcus Group told NTD News, The safety and welfare of our associates and customers is our top priority, and we're relieved to report that no one was harmed in the incident. We're cooperating with the San Francisco Police Department in their investigation. The increase in retail crime has negatively impacted stores throughout the city. Target acknowledged that San Francisco is the only city in the United States where they have decided to shorten store hours due to increasing retail crime. Similarly, Walgreens has already closed several stores throughout the city. 
The Public Policy Institute of California links the increase in property crime to Proposition 47. Prop 47 reduces charges for theft and fraud for amounts up to $950 from a felony to a misdemeanor with little pursuits or punishments. In response to the increase in crime, San Francisco Supervisor Asha Safai tweeted on July 2nd, Organized retail crime is weighing our city down. We can't afford to lose these anchor stores. Waiting to hear back on my letter of inquiry from our DA Chesa Bodine and Police Chief Bill Scott on their coordinated strategy. Supervisor Safai is giving the police and the DA's office a week to respond with a plan. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. California is moving forward with its high-speed rail project. Supporters are looking forward to three-hour travel times from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Opponents say the project is not worth its many costs. NTD's David Lamb has the story. What is to be the United States' first bullet train will connect the northern and southern parts of California in a new way. Advocates for the high-speed rail project met in a webinar on Tuesday to discuss how the Bay Area can benefit from the bullet train. The train is expected to transport people from Los Angeles to San Francisco in about 2 hours and 40 minutes. I think 8 of the 10 largest cities in the state of California. So. Um, it really is a new sense of connectivity. The planning committee says the rail system will run on 100% renewable energy and capable of reaching over 200 miles per hour. They have plans to transform the stations into community zones. You know, this could be the place you meet friends over coffee. It could be a farmer's market over the weekend. It could be where you get your dry cleaning. But opponents of this transportation project have argued that the project is costly and has been delayed multiple times. Mismanagement of funds have perpetuated California's debt. Former President Trump, who referred to the project as a disaster, previously blocked funds for the project. But last month, Governor Gavin Newsom and the Biden administration reached a deal to restore nearly $1 billion in project funds. In 2019, a Sacramento lawyer said the bullet train disrupts many agricultural areas, cutting through dozens of farms. California's state auditor reported in 2018 that the rail authority's decision-making and ongoing poor contract management for a wide range of high-value contracts have contributed to billions of dollars in cost overruns. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Heavy rain spurred a geyser in Texas Creek Tuesday. Take a look at this dramatic video. There was already a hole in the creek where the San Antonio water system was working. The company is installing a massive 25-foot wide sewer pipe. The hole filled with water due to the floodwaters, and that's when the geyser spouted. The water also toppled a shipping container and drowned large equipment. The multi-million dollar sewage pipe project is expected to take a while to complete. For years, Utah's Great Salt Lake has been shrinking, and a drought gripping the American West could make this year the worst yet. The shimmering blue waters of Utah's Great Salt Lake sprawl serenely across the desert, historically covering an area almost the size of Delaware. But for years, the largest natural lake west of the Mississippi has been shrinking. It's a disheartening afternoon for sailors like Marilyn Ross at the only remaining marina on the lake. Yeah, it's just sad. This is something that you get out on this lake and it's better than going to a psychiatrist, I say. <laughs> Ross and her husband have been sailing on a little red boat named Promiscuous here for 20 years. But this year, they had to hoist the vessel out of the water with a massive crane. Record low lake levels are expected and have already kept another main marina closed for years. Well, the lake has just gotten too shallow. Actually, the marina has gotten too shallow. And uh, normally we would all be getting ready for boating season, but instead uh, it's just too low. We didn't have a very good winter at all. And so now we're forced to pull our boats from the marina before they get trapped in here. Drought gripping the West could make this year the worst yet. The lake's levels are largely expected to hit a 170-year low this year. 20 years ago, the marina was full, 320 boats, every slip was rented. Uh, they're down to about 150 now. Drought has millions across the region bracing for a brutal wildfire season. For the Great Salt Lake, it's only the latest challenge. For years, people have been diverting water from rivers that flow into the lake to water crops and supply homes. We're sitting here now, there's um, a drought in the Western United States. We're having some of the highest temperatures that we've ever seen in Salt Lake. And we've been diverting water out of Great Salt Lake. We've been preventing water from getting into Great Salt Lake um, since, since the white settlers came here. The lake is shallow, 
only about 35 feet deep at its deepest point, and shorelines are receding. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Still to come, the shares of a Chinese ride-hailing giant are plunging. It comes after a series of ups and downs this week. And another Chinese takeover of a semiconductor plant. The Chinese-owned company is buying the UK's biggest chip maker. More soon here on NTD News. Now we look to the latest development of Chinese ride-hailing service Didi. That's after it endured a major crackdown on its home turf. NTD's Juliet Song has the details. China's largest ride-hailing company is getting more bad news. Its stock shares plunging over 20 percent. That's after Chinese authorities ordering a crackdown on the company. Just a week ago, ride-hailing service DD became a star in America's stock market. They're going to be raising just about $4 billion that values the company you know, in and around the $70 billion range. The company has been called China's version of Uber. It boasts over 300 million users in the country, but lately it's been losing money. This company has lost about $15 billion to date. And over the last, in 2020, it lost $2 billion, and for the first quarter, a billion. So the losses are staggering. It's now looking to raise big money in the United States. The company recently listed in the U.S. stock market and started the process of selling shares to the general public, what's called an IPO or initial public offering. So this is, looks to be one of the largest IPOs uh, this year globally, if not potentially the biggest IPO. But what happened after all the buzz came as a surprise. Two days after the company went from private to public, Chinese authorities went after it, ordering a cybersecurity review into DD. Soon after, the crackdown started escalating. China removed DD from the country's digital app stores. Officials also suspended new user registrations on the app. But Chinese authorities didn't give details on the reason behind the move. It alleges the company has seriously violated Chinese laws regarding the collection of user data. Didi says its revenue in China could take a hit following the crackdown. Still, in a statement, the company thanked authorities for their guidance and promised to fix the issue. It's left many wondering whether Beijing is using the crackdown to send a message. Aside from Didi, China also went after two other companies listed in the U.S. stock market. One interpretation is that the company's influence is making Beijing nervous. Major ones like DD or tech giant Tencent have access to huge amounts of user data. This in turn gives them power that Beijing may not want them to have. The latest crackdown might just be a flux, a reminder of who's actually in charge. Juliet Song, NTD News. The U.S. is denying entry to hundreds of Chinese students applying to study at top American colleges. The move is said to defend U.S. security and interests. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on the story. Over 500 Chinese students hoping to study science and engineering in the U.S. have failed to get their visas approved. That's according to CCP mouthpiece China Daily quoting an insider. According to the report, these students plan to get a master's or a Ph.D. in the U.S. Most of them are going to major in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, chemistry, material science, or biomedical science. The schools they're going to attend include MIT, Harvard, and Yale, among others. The report says most of these students applied for their student visa during the Biden administration. The insider says around 125 of the students have already gotten scholarships from the colleges they are about to attend. The U.S. reportedly denied them visa based on the Immigration and Nationality Act and an executive order by the Trump administration. The order prohibits students tied to the Chinese military from entering the U.S. The CCP's mouthpiece blames the Biden administration for saying one thing but doing another. They claim that President Biden is continuing what they claim to be Trump's wrong policy. And it severely undermines, as they call, the legitimate rights and interests of Chinese students. In the middle of a global chip shortage, the UK government has let a Chinese-owned company buy the UK's largest chip producer. The acquisition was announced yesterday. NTD's Patrick Hayden in London has the story. 
A Chinese-owned firm called Nexperia has acquired the UK's largest semiconductor producer. Currently, there's a global shortage of chips, and some say the deal has national security implications. Well, if this deal was to have taken place in the United States, there's absolutely no doubt that it would have been hauled up before CFIUS, the Committee on, Committee on Foreign Investment. In April, the UK government introduced the National Security and Investment Act, which includes preventing key assets from being taken over by foreign powers. The UK was meant to have powers that were equivalent, if not tougher, but Kwasi Kwarteng, the business secretary, has inexplicably decided not to act. The UK business secretary says the government is monitoring but doesn't want to intervene at the moment. And I think there's a, this is a real test moment for the UK's powers. If the business secretary doesn't act here in a case in which national security concerns are perhaps clearer than any other that I could imagine, many people will feel that the UK's powers are all bark and no bite. Armstrong says most company valuations globally have been decimated, with the exception of China. China, the country that has an awful lot to answer for in the spread of the disease, uh, is seeming to be the economic beneficiary of it. CNBC sources say the deal is worth $87 million. If so, that seems cheap as large semiconductor foundries tend to cost closer to the billion dollar and upward mark. Patrick Hayden, NTD News London. Semiconductors are the key of Beijing's competition with the free world. Chips are the brains of our electronic devices. Without them, modern life wouldn't be possible. Chips power our phones, control our cars, and run our computers. Not only that, they are a foundational technology, and all other technologies and many industries are based on chips. That's including the defense industry. China's chip technology is far behind the U.S.'s. One of the methods Beijing uses to catch up is technology theft Another one is buying chip factories in other countries. Up next, sprinter Shakari Richardson will not be selected to compete in the Olympics on Team USA. Fans are were hoping she would be given another chance. The success of the ninth Fast and Furious sequel is giving Hollywood hope that people are coming out to see movies again. Stay tuned to find out more. is finally over. Shen Yun returns to the stage with an all new production filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Discover the lost culture of ancient China. Discover this season, Shen Yun 2021. Coming to the Palace Theater, July 24th and 25th. Tickets at shenyun.com slash Stanford 888-90-SHOWS. If you're like most of us, you're probably getting fed up with the nonsense that's going on in the banking system. Did you know that top U.S. banks have recently amended their depositor terms and conditions to include the words bank failure? And what's required of you in 24 hours if, or should I say when, it happens? Don't get blindsided by your bank. Call GSI Exchange today to pick up your complimentary copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide at 866-424-424. 2382. We'll also send you the required format to file with your bank within 24 hours of their failure, which is now required by the top banks to avoid freezing of your funds. Yes, the top banks can now freeze your money. The world is in a strange place and banks are constantly changing the rules. So stay on top of the current events that really matter by calling GSI Exchange and requesting your free guide at 866-424-2382. Get ready, world, for a whole new way to invest. Introducing the Unicorn Hunters. We are talking about a cultural and economic shift. A savvy group of investors whose only job is to provide an unvarnished assessment of who they think can become the next unicorn. I am in and I'm going to invest. We all know why we're here. We're here to meet the next unicorn opportunity. This could be a game changer for a lot of families. Together with you, they're on the hunt for the next unicorn. France's Champagne Industry Group on Monday blasted a new Russian law forcing foreign champagne producers to add a sparkling wine reference to their bottles and called for champagne exports to Russia to be halted. NTD correspondent David Vives has more. 
France's government said on July 6th it may refer Russia to the World Trade Organization over Moscow's new law regarding to French champagne's label. Russian President Vladimir Putin's government plans to force French champagne producers to add the word sparkling wine to their labels, while Russian makers of Champagne Skoyer may continue to use that term alone. According to General Director of Champagne's Committee, Charles Gomer, this is stealing the Champagne brand. Producers are shocked and outraged. For 170 years, the wine growers have been working together to protect this name and make it recognized. They have the impression that they have been robbed. For them, Champagne is the apple of their eye. Champagne's name comes from the region in France where the beverage was developed in the mid-19th century. This is the result of specific characteristics in the environment there, and a special know-how. The grapes have come from Champagne region and respect precise steps all along the making. One secret of its recipe are the bubbles, created through a second fermentation of the wine inside the bottle. According to Gomer, Russia is a small market that imports just 2 million bottles each year from France. Russian authorities wouldn't let French wine in after the new law was put in place. Gomer says the two countries are negotiating. We will study this law deeply and see how we can maintain our business with Russia in a way that's fair for us. The name Champagne has legal protection in 120 countries, but not in Russia. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. American sprinter Shakari Richardson will not be selected to the U.S. 4x100 meter relay team for the Tokyo Olympic Games. She has accepted a one-month ban for testing positive for cannabis. Richardson was expected to be one of the biggest draws at the upcoming games, but was barred from the 100-meter race after testing positive for cannabis use, wiping out her victory at the U.S. Olympic trials last month. After her suspension, fans hoped she would be chosen to compete in the relay event. Coaches and USA Track and Field can select two runners on top of the first four trials finishers, but chose not to allow Richardson to compete. In a statement, USA Track and Field wrote, quote, All USATF athletes are equally aware of and must adhere to the current anti-doping code, and our credibility as the national governing body would be lost if rules were only enforced under certain circumstances. Richardson said in an NBC interview last week that she used the banned substance to cope with the death of her mother, but took responsibility for breaking Olympic rules. Her agent did not immediately respond to a request for comment. USA Track and Field said the World Anti-Doping Agency would reevaluate its rules regarding THC, the main active ingredient in cannabis. Gareth Southgate's England team is preparing for the game of their lives as they, as they try to reach their first major final since the 1966 World Cup. NTD's Joy Duguid brings us this report. London is a buzz ahead of England's much anticipated Euro 2020 semi-final match against Denmark to be played at Wembley Stadium on Wednesday. England fans are optimistic about their side's chances. I am positive. I've got to say very positive about the, the semi-finals. The way that we've played so far, very, very good. It's going to be close. It's going to be close. If we play well, I think we've got a chance. I don't want to be too optimistic though. I've been disappointed so many times. Denmark have had an incredible run, delighting fans even though they lost one of their stars to a cardiac arrest in their opening game. But Gareth Southgate's side has inspired England fans as they try to reach their first major final since the 1966 World Cup triumph. Unbeaten England start as clean favourites with a stronger squad and home advantage. The fear that gripped them in previous campaigns refreshingly absent so far. The game will take place in front of 60,000 fans at Wembley, but due to COVID-19 restrictions, only Danes resident in the United Kingdom will be able to attend. A fan zone has been set up in Trafalgar Square, where fans not holding tickets will come together to cheer their teams on. Joy Duguid, NTD News. F9, the latest installment in the Fast and Furious franchise, cracked $500 million in global ticket sales over the weekend. It's feeling optimism that the Hollywood blockbuster is back. 
being shut down during the health crisis. The only movie from a Hollywood studio to even come close was Godzilla vs. Kong, which unlike Fast and Furious, was also released on the HBO Max streaming service at the same time when it debuted in April. After a delayed start to the traditional summer blockbuster season, Hollywood is taking heart from box office numbers that suggest the audiences will come back to the big screen for the right movie. A Quiet Place 2, a smaller budget flick, has been quietly raking in the dough for weeks. Its global box office take is now more than $257 million. It reportedly only cost about $61 million to make. That's fueling enthusiasm as Disney gets ready to finally release Black Widow on July 9th, the latest movie from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, arguably the most valuable movie franchise out there. The comic book action hero film starring Scarlett Johansson will debut simultaneously at theaters and on the Disney Plus streaming service for an additional fee. Thanks for watching. My team and I are honored to be your source for the news. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. A new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.